Most of you probably know that uh, Ray McGovern served as a senior CIA intelligence officer for 27 years uh, before retiring in 1990. Um, before that, he was in Army Intelligence. I first met Ray in 2011, um, and it was actually right on in the cusp of the Occupy movement, and we were actually uh, both participating in the Occupy movement in Freedom Plaza back then before I moved to the state of Washington. I was living in the other Washington at the time. But uh, since then, Ray has been a real uh, mentor and guide to me, helping me to kind of get over my, I, I forgot to mention, I was also in the CIA for 27 years. So we have that in common in a different era. He kind of helped me get out of my little shell to start writing about my experiences in government and to talk about sort of the abuses and the, um, basically the realities in government that Americans everywhere who pay taxes and, and for whom we're their public servants have a right to know. So I owe Ray a great debt of gratitude for uh, uh, mentoring me in many ways um, all these years and we're really privileged to have him here. Um, so without further ado, Ray McGovern. <laughs> start things off with a little song. Wow. Uh, yeah. We have to sort of bear each other's spirits up here, and we're very good singers, both of us. <laughs> Should we talk about what the song means? Yeah, uh, what the song means. Uh, well, uh, it's entitled um, Die Gedanken sind frei. Oh, yeah. Ah, well, yes. Very, so some of you know German. It means thinking is free, OK? And the way I learned it was from Elizabeth, who grew up in Germany, went to school there, and speaks far better German than I do. But we were touring Germany, uh, several main cities, there were about eight of them, I think, where we both spoke. And uh, in one, between one of two of these cities, we were in a train and a you know, cattle car, the sort of tourist thing, and, and uh, uh, Elizabeth started singing, Die Gedanken sind frei, right? And there were some elderly women across the aisle older than I am, I mean, really older. <laughs> and they joined in. Die Gedanken sind frei. And before you knew it, the whole car was singing the song, you know? And we'll tell you what it means in a second. But, but the idea is that this, this was a song sung by us, by the opposition up to Hitler during the Third Reich, okay? And it, Die uh, Gedanken sind frei, the thinking is free, Wer kann sie erraten? Who, who can figure it out, what the thinking is? Sie, sie fliegen vorbei, sie, they, they fly, or just by, like uh, clouds in the, in the sky. Uh, okay, we'll sing it, and then we'll translate the rest of it. You ready? Okay. Die Gedanken sind frei, wer kann sie erraten? Sie fliegen vorbei. Die himmlischen Schlachten, Heinrich kann sie wissen, kein Wege erschießen, mit Pulver und Blei, die Gedanken sind frei. Yeah. Hang on for a second, I need the Kabir. So, so the, uh, the idea is uh, you, you can't find out who, who's thinking, you just keep thinking, and they fly by like. Uh, Clouds, clouds in the night, and uh, you can't stop it. So after we were finished singing, and we turned to the elderly ladies there, and we said, at least I said, I imagine you were not able to sing that during the Third Reich. And they looked at me, and they said, we sang it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, that just kind of, well, it's it tough said to me that even in the worst of times, there are people singing that song. And that's, that's us today. And uh, I'm delighted that we could start out with that way. Now, um, I'm going to borrow my kafia back. Simply because injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. I was in the US boat to Gaza in 2011. We got nine nautical miles out of Athens, and uh, uh, they, they turned us, they, 
the Ninja Turtle guys from the uh, um, Greek Coast Guard trained by the Israelis turned us back. But uh, those folks now, uh, are they out of prison? All of them? Yeah. Okay. Except for one, one Swedish person, but he's voluntarily yeah. staying. Well, you know the story, and they were tasered, and they were hurt, and they were treated uh, just as badly as some of the people on that, uh, that trip uh, back in uh, with Mommy. Bobby Mamara the, the year before us. Do I see Kit back there? <laughs> Kit, would you stand up? Kit was one of the co-passengers here. I haven't seen Kit in about 10 years, and uh, Alice Walker was a, a less well-known passenger, but we had a, a whole bunch of really good folks, including some folks from the New York Times, from the CBS. From, it was amazing how the people in charge of our boat put that thing together. So what I'd like to do is, is start out with a, a little uh, remembrance here, a sort of a, um, a uh, uh, presente, so to speak, for my good friends here, uh, who are, of course, the Kings Bay plowshares. I have the distinction of having been arrested with three of them, four of them. I know them all personally, and they are a great witness to me. And so I'd just like to start out with a little remembrance of them. And the best way to do that, I think, is for us to be Quaker-like silent for half a minute. You may wish to remember them in your thoughts and prayers as they go to trial, I guess, September, October. I don't know the, the latest. But they're going to throw the book at them. You could be sure of that. Could you say all of their names, please? Oh, sure. Yeah. Here's Claire Grady. Here's... Uh, uh, Phil Berrigan's wife, Elizabeth, Elizabeth McAllister. Uh, that's uh, O'Neill, uh, Patrick O'Neill from North Carolina. There's Carmen Trotta from the Catholic Worker House in, in, uh, in Manhattan. Uh, that's Father um, Steve, Kelly. Steve Kelly. Here's Martha Hennessy, Dorothy Day's granddaughter. And that's uh, Colville, uh, Bill Colville. From Massachusetts, he runs a Catholic worker uh, type operation up there. I've been in jail with him in Syracuse, New York, uh, with Martha down in Washington. Steve, uh, well, I know I haven't been in jail with him, but Carmen in Washington, him in Washington, uh, she in Washington, and Claire, not yet, uh, but uh, <laughs> with, with, with her sisters have been. So, you know, it's, uh, what do I say? Uh, now, Steve has been in jail, I think, about 12 years altogether, and then I got to let him off easy. Uh, he is a disciple of Daniel Bergen, another Jesuit. And, uh, oh, yeah, a little story here. Uh, these guys, Steve and Martha, decided to uh, mark the anniversary of the killing of those Jesuits in Salvador with a, a celebration of Fordham University, my alma mater. And they asked me to come up from Washington and speak. So I did. And then they said, now we have to leave real quickly. Sorry about that. And they, they're off. Martha explained to me just last week that they were doing their final planning for, for the uh, plowshares action and that they couldn't tell me where they were going. And she apologized for being so abrupt, but they had the other people waiting for them. So, so that was kind of nice to reflect on. Well, yeah, please, question. I was just going to mention Steve Kelly, as I understand it, he usually ended up in solitary confinement because he doesn't cooperate. Yeah, he doesn't cooperate, and uh, he has some magical, some spirit-filled way of surviving in to intact. You know, when he comes out, he's just as healthy and even more like, resolute. Yeah, he's, a, he's a spiritual. Yeah. So thanks for, for mentioning yeah, and that. I didn't catch, what were they, what were they arrested for? So they were arrested at the other big Trident base, actually, it's bigger than Ours, I think. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, they broke in on the anniversary of uh, Martin Luther King's uh, uh, death 50 years ago, April 4th. And uh, they, uh, well, they arrested almost immediately some of them. Others so <laughs> were able to spend, spend some time in the museum with the tourists, but they all got uh, wrapped up. And only a few of them were let out uh, because they had personally, Norman Trotter, for example, his father is dying. And what and does homicide mean? It means killing everybody. Everything. Yeah, everything, right. 
So in other words, all life, uh, omni for, for all side. To, okay, so um, I just wanted to start out with this remembrance because these are the real deal in my view and we need to keep them in touch, keep in touch with them. Brian Wilson is another person that I ask you to keep in prayer. He's not in good shape down there in El Salvador. I met him first up here. Uh, he is also a witness and a prophet to me. And let's see, who else? Well, Arch. Uh, who, who knows who we're speaking to here about? Arch. Who's Arch? Archbishop Anthalsen. Yeah, right. <laughs> Some of you are not old enough to remember Arch, but that's what he went, that's what he went by with Jim and Shelley Douglas and the rest of them. Arch and Dutch, right. So they were both. The real friends call them Arch, the real close ones. And I'll just mention in passing that at his funeral just last week, the homilist, maybe many of you know this, uh, talked, about, uh, talked about him being uh, holy ground here, you know, that he created holy ground. So now we have, we have a real holy ground zero, you know? <laughs> and uh, the interesting thing is that in the, in the homily, he's, you know, usually in these homilies you have, Oh, this bishop, you know, this priest inspired X, Y, Z. He inspired, blah, blah, blah. No, no. This homily was, this bishop was inspired, first and foremost, by Bill and Shelley Douglas. <laughs> A lot of the other folks at Ground Zero, you know? That's the way it works, folks. You know, we can inspire people. Can you imagine that? We can actually inspire people. And I think that's what we're doing today. So, um, I'll say something about Arch. Arch just rang a bell to me last night. I was putting my finally notes together, and I said, oh, I'll look it up. I'll look it up on uh, I'll Google Arch. Yeah? This is what I found. Arch uh, is a curved, symmetrical structure <laughs> spanning an opening and typically supporting the weight of a bridge. Uh, wow. Like a sturdy stone arch. I think it's like what arch was, you know? Supported us, connected us with others, taught us how to connect with others, did things like withholding half of his taxes, you know? Did things like demonstrating with us, did things like letting himself be inspired by us. Jim and Shelley, by the way, send their very best to you all. I talked to Jim just a couple of days ago uh, at Douglas. So, you know, that's kind of neat for me to think about the uh, arch being an arch and we being supported by arch now. And of course, Jim, a deeply, deeply believer, uh, says, look, uh, Ray, people say, oh, they're too bad that arch is gone. Well, arch isn't gone, you know? For those of us who believe in the community of saints, man, we got a real, real advocate up there now, uh, stronger than he was when he's down here. And I believe that. And it's good to believe that kind of thing. I don't think it's illusory. So, let me get back to the. To the, the first one to do an all-night vigil here with us. Uh huh. First, first one to do an all-night vigil. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, um, I want to uh, call attention to two things having to do with the subject at hand here, on this side. And one is a chapter in the Untold History of the United States by Oliver Stone and Peter Kuznick. Uh, they have an incredible chapter. With books like this, I usually don't tear out chapters. <laughs> but this is worth tearing out and actually memorizing. It's called The Bomb, The Tragedy of a Small Man. Who's a small man? Truman. It's incredibly well researched, folks. I suggest you, I suggest you read it closely. I was going to draw from it heavily, but you can read it yourself, so I won't do that. But there are a couple of things that I will call your attention to. One is this: you make, they make it clear uh, that well, at, at the bottom of the way we regarded uh, Japanese people and particularly our military authorities, and Truman himself, and his Secretary of State, Jimmy Burns, because Jimmy Burns was South Carolina, okay? It was out and out racism. Truman never referred to African Americans without using the N-word. We know that. 
There are lots of quotes in here that would shock you. I won't read all of them, but there is one, I think, that the, you guys know who... Uh, uh, Ernie Pyle is? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, Ernie Pyle. All right, this is the paragraph in which Ernie appears. Historian John Dower has shown that Americans thought of the Japanese as vermin, cockroaches, rattlesnakes, and rats. Simeon imagery abounded. Admiral William Bull Halsey, Halsey, commander of the South Pacific Force, was notorious in this regard, urging his men forward to kill the yellow monkeys and get some more monkey meat, direct quotes. People questioned whether the Japanese were really human. Time wrote, Time magazine, the ordinary unreasoning Jap is ignorant. Perhaps he is human, nothing indicates that. The British Embassy in Washington reported back to London that the Americans viewed the Japanese as, quote, nameless mass of vermin, end quote. And the ambassador described the American universal extermination feeling against the Japanese. Here comes Ernie Pyle. When popular war correspondent Ernie Pyle was transferred from Europe to the Pacific in February 1945, he observed, quote, in Europe, we felt that our enemies, horrible and deadly as they were, were still people. But out here in the Pacific, I soon gathered that the Japanese were looked upon as something subhuman and repulsive, the way some people feel about cockroaches or mice. So, you know, there, there goes our original sin again, huh? <laughs> Unless we address that, both here in this country, in our attitude toward people who don't look like us, whether they're in Afghanistan or Iraq or Somalia or Yemen, unless we come to terms with that, uh, we're not doing justice in any real sense. You know, even General Westmoreland, I was going to tell a joke about having such high regard for him, I have very low regard for William Westmoreland, who was commander of our chief, uh, commander of our forces in Vietnam. After the war, may, many of you have probably seen this little video clip. He was interviewed, he's got his nice little jacket on, and he says, you know, uh, the Oriental, the Oriental doesn't put the same price on life. In the Orient, uh, life is cheap. And so you have to realize that when you're approaching the Orient. But the Orientals, well, they just don't have the same attitude toward life as we do. He says that on camera to explain why he could do the things he could do. So we've got a long way to go. Now, where was General Westmoreland from? Anybody know? Where was he from? Where was he from? What state? Yes. South Carolina. South Carolina. Yeah, South Carolina. So we got a ways to go, folks. There are other ex examples I could, I could adduce, but I won't. Now, um, I don't have the book with me here, but do you know about uh, the Doomsday Machine by uh, Daniel Ellsberg? Uh, dare I ask how many have read it? Whoa! This is terrific. Dan sent me a really, really nice, he copied with a really nice, Inscription. And I saw him three months later in Washington. He was giving a talk. He said, Have you read it? <laughs> you know the answer you give. Well, I started it. I'm well, well into it, you know. And, you know, he's, he's a real mensch. He's so gentle, you know. He didn't say, Oh, you know. He said, I sent that thing to you three weeks, three months ago. He didn't say any of that. He just said, Oh, okay, well, see if you can. Well, I have, folks. I have. I've read it like, like my Irish grandfather used to say, he read the Irish Echo in New York. He read it page to page, black and white. <laughs> you know what that means? The, the
print and in, the lines in between, all right? So I read that thing, and it is the most important book that I've ever read, bar none. It has to do with side and how close we've come in the past and what we might try to do about it. It's a, a cri de coeur. It, it's a, it's, it stands like a scene to all of us. And so I strongly suggest that those of you who, like I would have been, haven't read the whole thing, you need to, you need to do that. Um, he adduces lots of close calls, you know, times when we, we really just, people call it luck, people call it providence, people call it or a miracle. I call, I call it a miracle, so does Dan. It's a miracle that we're still here, okay? And I won't go through all the, all the information that, that, that Dan adduces, but key to it is, you know, only one man can pull the, the nuclear trigger, right? No. no, no way. That thing was delegated down to a battalion commander, for God's sake. Uh, out in Japan, there were people with nuclear weapons on there and it, that nobody even knew about. So that's one of the scariest things. You know, you don't have to read about drugs in, in the ICBM silos. Uh, you don't have to read about today. Just look at how close we came in the past. Now, I'm just going to adduce one thing that uh, Dan does mention. How many know uh, who Vasily Alexandrovich Arkhipov is? Wow, this is good. Okay. Well, he was a political hack. Okay. But he was deputy commander of the fleet outside of Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, why do I say it was a hack? Well, the, the communists had this weird thing where they needed a political officer together with the military so that if a, an order came, uh, the party had to be behind it, not, not the uh, military, right? Okay, so here's that guy. And when, the, when there was silence, when the submarines around Cuba, which had nuclear torpedoes on them, okay? When there was silence for a week or so, no word from Moscow, and there were depth charges coming down from US surface ships, uh, there was panic. And uh, they reasoned, that is, the two uh, naval officers on this one, one torpedo ship, reasoned that the, pro the war probably started. Uh, they might as well just let go of their uh, uh, nuclear armed torpedoes and sink take a couple of U.S. ships in the process, okay. So they both had their fingers on the, the key, so to speak, and Arhipa says, no. He says, why not? He says, we have no orders, we have no approval from Moscow, no. And his approval was needed. And that prevented the Cuban Missile Crisis from turning out in a way that none of us would be around today, probably. So that was, that was uh, Dmitry uh, Arhipov, and uh, 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 Dan Ellsberg Dan explains that whole thing. Um, one thing I learned yesterday, it really helps to go around to, to talk in different places, is guess where Arhipov had served before? He had served in the, the Soviet-Japanese War in 1945. How long did that war last? Anybody know? It's a couple weeks? <laughs> okay. Guess what? He visited Hiroshima. He knew what that did. So, I don't know if that was part of his calculus and say, no, let's not do this. But that meant a lot to me. I, I googled it, the heck out of it last night to make sure it was true. And that's what I found, that he was with the naval fleet that uh, was involved in the uh, Far East in the war against Japan, which only lasted a week or so after we dropped the two atomic bombs. So, wow, you know, personal experience can have a real, real effect on these things. Now, the other thing I'm going to mention is uh, something that, uh, uh, well, it's, it's a, a story very close to my heart, because two of the main characters are people who worked for me in the 70s. I was a pretty young branch chief, 
but I was head of the Soviet foreign policy branch at CIA. And I had some really, really good people, uh, PhDs in Soviet history and that kind of thing. And Mel Goodman was, was one of them, a good friend of mine. A fellow named Bobby Gates was, was another of them. Not so much a friend of mine anymore. Uh, you may know him as Robert Gates, uh, head of the CIA and then defense secretary who, after urging Obama, yes, yeah, go ahead and put more people, thousands more in Afghanistan, warned the West Point cadets, the last thing you want to do is to get involved in a land war, a land war in Asia. Even MacArthur warned about that. Whoa, 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 you know? Anyhow, I knew Gates and I, I rated him uh, uh, an exceptional analyst, but so overtly, overtly ambitious that he was a uh, disruptive influence in the branch. You know, when you flit around with all your bosses, bosses <laughs> all day, then people see that, and it's a disruptive influence. Mel Goodman was just the opposite. He did his work, and I put both of them on our rotating team, uh, having to do with the strategic arms limitation talks, the SALT talks, which were going on in 1970, 1971, and 1972, I had the pleasure uh, the honor of being in Moscow for the signing of the anti ballistic Missile Treaty and the other treaties that were associated with that. Now, both Goodman and Gates were in this rotation. We had one person on the delegation, we had one person uh, writing for the director back home, and one person on the support team for the military uh, political angle of things. Why do I mention all this? Well, here's the story. How many of you heard about Abel Archer exercise in November of 1983? Oh, good. Oh, a couple. All right. Well, you can listen through this anyway, right? Okay. Uh, it's scary, um, but hang on to your hats. September 1st, uh, 1983, KAL 007, Korean, Korean Airlines passenger plane. Uh, was uh, flying over the most sensitive Soviet naval and aircraft uh, installations over Sakhalin, over the Chukot Peninsula, into Siberia. Uh, there was no re rhyme or reason to why they did that, but unfortunately, the course it flew resembled very much uh, the course that uh, RC uh, 135s. Anybody know what RC 135 is? Yeah. What is it? Yeah, it's a great big uh, plane with, with the, the electronic surveillance. Yeah. Okay. So um, the Soviets uh, thought, whoops, here's another RC-122 coming. Well, where is it going? Why is it coming right into Arlie? Right? So, so the alert went up. And we have the transmissions between control tower and pilot. You see that? Yeah, I see them. We'll go up there and flap your wings, get them to stop, get them to come to the ground. Well, no response, sir. Uh, well, uh, Fly around a couple times. No, no response, sir. Okay, shoot him. Shoot him down. <coughs> 200 and, I forget, 69 or so people killed, including one congressman. Okay, well, now this is a big deal. And I was briefing the president's daily brief in those days. And I was on right as this happened. And when I went to Secretary Schultz, I made sure that I had the experts the experts I could trust from the Soviet division who knew all, knew all about aircraft, knew all about air defense, and knew they could interpret this for Schultz. Okay. So he was very interested, obviously, and he said, well, what do we know about that? And they said, well, uh, he was shot down. They thought, it was, uh, they thought it was an intruder, and actually, Mr. Secretary, it was an intruder. Uh, they were in Soviet airspace for a long time, and so they were shut down. Now, Schultz was interested in knowing was it deliberate? Now, listen carefully. We all said yes. They deliberately shot a plane down. Main question, of course, was did they know it was a civilian passenger plane? And my experts said, we can't tell that, sir. We can't tell that they knew it was a passenger plane. Whoa. Well, that's the best we could do. But we tell it like it is, right? We go home, 
Next thing on the radio, Schultz is saying they deliberately shut down a passenger plane, KAL-007. They go to the UN, they play the tape, right? They, they give to, there used to be something called the USIA, United States Information Agency, now part of the State Department. But they had a lot of experts. And Charlie Wick was head of it then, and they, they had these, that whole division for video, right? And the video guy was given the tape, and they showed it to the UN, and man, they blackened the, the, the hell out of the Soviet Union for doing this deliberately, shooting down and killing so many passengers. Now, what's the rest of the story? Well, the fellow who, who got the eight minute tape, 10, 10 years later, he had a chance to listen to the whole 55 minutes. And the whole 55 minutes makes it very clear that they didn't know it was a passenger. It was pitch black out there. They had no way of knowing it was a passenger plane. So did they deliberately shoot down an aircraft? Yes. Did they know it was a civilian aircraft? No. And the tape showed it. Now, how do I know that? He wrote a book about it. Yeah. And what was the main lesson he wanted us all to take away? This is it. It's a quote. You have to realize that all governments lie, including our own government, uh, the, the prize goes to whoever lies first. Whoever lies first wins. So, you know, that's the main lesson? Anyhow, that incident led to a whole spiral of events. We knew at the time, that is the fall of, the fall of 1983, that word had gone out from KGB headquarters that they feared a, a, a surprise nuclear attack by the United States. All their agents were tasked to collect on that. Then we had uh, Reagan getting up and saying the USSR is an evil empire, that they're terrible people. Uh, and then we had an exercise. It was called Able Archer. Now this was an exercise what's called the mother of all exercises. We had the Navy sort of penetrating uh, Soviet naval space. We had air, aircraft up in the Arctic penetrating uh, uh, areas that we had never penetrated before. And then this one, one exercise was to involve the President of the United States himself, the Vice President, the Secretary of Defense, and the National Security Advisor for, for the President. So it was a big deal. Now, Mel Goodman saw that this was likely to be viewed by the Soviet Union as preparations for a surprise attack. Meanwhile, we had Pershing II missiles in place in Europe, which gave the, bottom line was it gave the, the Russians like 10, 15 minutes to react to an attack on the command and control system. Like, you, you couldn't imagine a more perilous kind of situation. Then, one of the, uh, well, one of the national security advisors was heard to say, you know, I think we really scared the Russians, and I think maybe we overdid it. <laughs> well, Mel, Mel Goodman didn't think that was funny. So he went to Bobby Gates, back to the star. He says, Bob, my God, the tell of the White House, the Russians are taking this seriously, for God's sake. No, we've been telling the White House that the Russian expressions of concern about our strategic weapons are not to be taken seriously. We're not going to do that. So, to his great credit, Mel Goodman went to Bill Casey. And as Mel Goodman explains it, this is the only time that Bill Casey, the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, listened to Mel Goodman. But he did listen. He went down to the White House right away, and he got the thing knocked off. No, no participation by anybody big. Tell the Russians, this is just an exercise. Please, cool things down. So, you know, you didn't know this story, right? Um, uh, Dan doesn't really cover it in any detail. But in some ways, uh, my friend Mel Goodman is another Arkhipov. And there are several stories like this. So just realize how labile is the German word, how, what's it, tentative, how how delicate it is when you have thousands of missiles on hair trigger alert, which we still do for no god 
for no reason in God's earth. And that's why, you know, when you, when you have Trump, now, my wife always tells me, tell her how much you think of Trump before you say anything good. Say, All right. Well, I think Trump is the very worst president the United States ever had. He stands for everything I detest, okay? But even a broken clock, what's it, can be read what? Twice a day. Twice a day? Right, okay. Well, he's right. That there's no reason that we can't have a more decent relationship with Russia. There's no reason, folks. The Soviet Union imploded in 1991. You know, they're not trying to take over the world anymore. Hello? Only the people that profiteer in arms making and arms trading believe that or pretend to believe it. So, you know, here he, here he talks to Putin. And he goes, oh my God, he's talking just. The Germans say, unter vier Augen, under four eyes. Face to face with 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 Putin. Oh God, he's going to give the going to give the star away, uh, and uh, and when he comes back, headline in the New York Times, Trump with Putin throws doubt on U.S. intelligence. My God, <laughs> who would want to throw doubt on U.S. intelligence? We've always been right, especially like before the war in Iraq. We know there were weapons of mass destruction there. We know that uh, we knew that Sam, that, that Saddam Hussein was in, in cahoots with Al Qaeda. We knew all that stuff, and we reported it. But it didn't turn out to be quite well. It was not really true. Uh, so, but you still you should throw never, never throw doubt on U.S. intelligence. My God, I was say, what should the headline have been? In my view, and I started saying this right after I heard right after I saw those headlines. It should have been, Doomsday Clock moved back from two minutes before midnight to four minutes before midnight, <coughs> simply by virtue of the fact that we're talking to one another. That at the highest level, no matter who's in charge, Trump, <coughs> Putin, we're talking to each other. And even Winston Churchill you know, was fond of saying, it's far better to jaw, jaw, than to war, war. So, um, so we've come really close, and uh, and as was mentioned before, um, in times past, we've been able to have an impact on things. It's not always evident at the time, but often we can do that. And so I'd like to transition here to times when people have stood up and, uh, and done something uh, something like what Raymond Hunthauser did, Hunthausen, and what the rest of us have done, and that is stand up against injustice. Uh, Dan Berrigan is sort of uh, one of my prophets. Um, and after the Catonsville action, the Catonsville action where they burned draft cards, poured their blood on, on them, and so forth, uh, they were taken into the federal building in Catonsville, Maryland. It was the only federal building there. It was the post office, right? Yeah. <laughs> remember that? Remember that? Okay. So they're sitting around there, and uh, Dan, Dan is thinking to himself, now how do I know this? Because he wrote it in his autobiography. And if you want to treat, read To Dwell in Peace. It's about 40 years old now, but I read it when it first came out. Thank God. So what does Dan say? Dan says, you know, I, uh, I realized in a new way that this was big. We, we, this was a major action. And, uh, and we're gonna, I'm going to be called a commie, a, a, a dumb, dumb person, incredibly naive against, uh, against the army. You know? So Dan, was it, what was it worth doing? He said, it took me a while to come to the realization that, well, the good is worth doing because it's good. That results are not unimportant, but they're secondary. They're secondary to the action that is good. So I find in my last couple of years that most Americans are hung up with results, hung up with success. Um, and that's what, not what uh, Dan was thinking at the moment. 
And I just uh, remind you that Dan was also a poet and a, quite a writer. And so in the next paragraph of his autobiography, this reads, just then, the door to the post office flings open and a paradigm of an FBI inspector walks in. And he looks around, he sees my brother Phil in his clerics, and he says, you, you again, I'm going to change my religion. <laughs> and Dan writes, no higher compliment could come to my brother. <laughs> so what am I saying here? I'm saying here that you can be very profound and reason to a really good conclusion, but you have to keep your sense of humor. Without a sense of humor, most of you know this, without a sense of humor, we're not gonna last very long in this business, all right? So here's Dan putting a humorous touch to this, where uh, it was funny, especially what he said about uh, no greater compliment could come to my brother, my brother Phil. So, um, I'll say one other thing about Dan. Uh, this is a quote that I, uh, I learned just recently. And he said, and this is just one sentence, so please listen. He said, the difference between doing something and doing nothing is everything. <laughs> Hello. You don't have to be a poet to understand that. The difference between doing nothing and doing something, or something and nothing, is everything. Now, the last time I saw Dan, yeah, Bergen or that's that's their Ber Bergen. That's interesting. They're both Dan's, aren't they? They both spend time in prison together, lots of time. They're really good friends. Okay. So uh, last time I saw Dan Bergen, he was failing. He was in the infirmary that the Jesuits run for all Jesuits at Fordham, my alma mater. And so I, I had the pleasure. Uh, I was lucky. He was there, and I was there giving a lecture. There's one professor that still has me give lectures, <laughs> if you can believe it. And uh, he's an adjunct, so you know he can do these things. Um, so I had a session with you know, we were three of us, and uh, I asked for his blessing. And uh, apparently, not many people had done that recently. But he, he was very gracious. He gave me his blessing. And then I said, Father Dan, uh, two weeks from now, a group of friends of mine and I are going to give Ed Snowden a special award in Moscow. Do you know Ed Snowden? Oh, sure I do. He had a pile of books that he was reading, you know, and he had the newspaper right there. He said, sure, yeah. I said, well, would you have any word for, for Ed Snowden? And he says, yes. He could have, you know, you couldn't hear him, but yeah, yeah. Tell him he did the right thing. Tell him he did the right thing. Okay. So I said, okay. Now, I just talked to Dan Ellsberg last week. I told him I might be able to see you now, and I and he asked me if you had any word for him. And he immediately knew who Dan Ellsberg was. He says, yeah, yeah. He says, tell him he did the right thing too. <laughs> <laughs> now, at first I didn't. I mean, that's pretty profound when you come right down to it. But you don't recognize it in the beginning, and that's what we're all about here: trying to do the right thing, right? And uh, results again. Not unimportant, but secondary to the goodness of the act. Now, I want to finish up here uh, with, a, uh, with a little account that comes from my niece. And uh, your niece? From, from my niece's daughter, yeah. Now, my niece has several daughters. and. Uh, as my grandmother would say, they didn't get it from the moon. <laughs> they have this in-your-face quality when justice is concerned. Okay? Now, this pertains to, I think, what we're all about here, so it's not kind of extraneous. Please bear with me. This is my niece writing about her daughter, Helen. At the end of the parent-teacher conference, they ask you if you have any questions, then they let you go your merry way. But not this time. The teacher said she wanted to talk to me about something that happened on the playground. Apparently, Helen was playing with one of her favorite friends, and a boy came up and hit her friend in the face really hard. 
causing her to bleed. As soon as I heard this from the teacher, I remembered a conversation that Helen and I had had in the car one day after I picked her up, where she told me a boy had hit a girl in the face so hard that she started bleeding. And that's where the story ended, with Helen. But the teacher went on to say that after the girl had been punched in the face, Helen stepped up, got between them, and said in no uncertain terms, we do not hit. Helen is six years old. Okay? The teacher was telling me that, that she swooped in before my little Helen got clocked. <laughs> and, if, and that it might be in my best interest to explain to my sweet little Helen where she goes to school. Now, they live in an inner city. Um, it's a Title I school, which means that 40% of the children are on free or reduced lunch. Being mean or nice certainly doesn't, it's not based on economics, but some kids have been exposed to crime and violence, which may have given them a different view on hitting. As I processed what Helen had done and all of the possible outcomes, I felt one thing more than all the others, I felt pride. Helen gets scared about way more than the average little bear. She can see the danger in more things than most people, but let me be clear here. I think that Helen knew that what she did was not the safest option for her. This teacher wanted me to explain to Helen that if she stood up for someone while they were taking a hit, that it could turn on her and, and she might take a blow. Now, this is wise counsel. But I would never tell my sweet Helen to change what she did. Fear is an awful decision-making partner. But this is it. Nothing will change for the better without somebody who's not getting hit, stepping up and standing between the one doing the harm and the one being harmed. It's the lesson of history. It's the lesson of our collective human experience. It's a lesson of our own individual story. Standing between the one doing harm and the one being harmed does a beautiful thing. It says, this person is being hurt. And this person should not be hit, because as a people, we do not hit. It does no good, it does harm. And in order to make this change in attitude and behavior, people watching have to turn into people engaging. People watching have to turn into people engaging. Now, I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but just hear the rest of this. So for today, for today says my niece, don't let people get pounded in the face and just watch. There is a time to channel your inner Helen and get up in the face of someone who has already proven to be dangerous and say, you will not do that again when I am here. She is not alone. I am standing up to you. Now, it will take more than one. While it would break my heart, if Helen had been punched in the face that day. I hoped that one of her friends would have come forward, stepped up between her and the boy, and said in no uncertain terms, we do not hit. We are a people who do not hit. We are also a people who get up in the face of those proven to be dangerous and say, if you do that again, you need to deal with me. That's what we're about here, folks getting in the way of dangerous people and saying to them, we do not hit. Thank you very much. We have a lot of time for questions. Yes, we do. Um, we have some time for questions. And just before we start the Q&A, I just wanted to mention that this, this afternoon we will have an opportunity, if you wish, to write um, 
letters to some of the plowshares folks that are still in prison, such as Steve Kelly. I have a stack of those special pre-stamped postcards that the prison will accept. And they're very, very fussy about how you address it. If it's not exactly right, they will send it back. So what I'll do is I'll print out the, the exact correct address so that we can um, comfort Steve Kelly, who would love to hear from us. He's probably in solitary confinement as we speak. Thank you. And doing yoga right now. And probably, and probably doing yoga. Yes, please. Didn't you end up getting thrown out of a confirmation hearing in Washington, D.C. just recently regarding somebody who was uh, proposed as a torturer yeah. for the CIA? Yeah, I did. Yeah, this was Gina Hospital who was in charge of the first black site where torture was conducted under her supervision, waterboarding and others, uh, by at least two people, or at least one, al-Nashiri. Now, what happened was uh, I went to the confirmation here. That's one benefit of being in Washington. You get to go to these things, right? <laughs> so I dressed up like, uh, like one of the indigenous and the people who go to these things. They even wore a tie, you know, so I'd be respectable. <laughs> so I get a seat. And uh, the, uh, the chair, uh, he's um, uh, Burr, Richard Burr, a senator from North Carolina, who, when he took over from uh, Diane Feinstein uh, from California, the first thing he did was to say, I'm the chair now, and I own all the copies of the CIA torture report that was done by this committee over a four-year period and, and completed it last December. So I recall all those copies. I want all those copies right back here in my office. And what does that tell you, huh? What does that tell you? For those of you who are familiar with that, it is an incredibly damning report based on original CIA documents as to what our prisoners were subjected to by the likes of Gina Haspel. So he, he starts out this meeting Richard Burr from North Carolina. He says, now, we're going to have an open session here, and uh, I suppose there'll be somebody who will want to make a, make a statement. If you do, get up, be quick, be, be, be rapid, and be out of here. I'm saying to myself, whoa, wow, that sounds like an unusual open invitation. So I file that away in the back of my mind. And then when Senator Ron Wyden from Yay, Oregon, Oregon, yeah, he says, now, Ms. Haspel, um, were you in charge of the black site in Thailand? Were you there when Al-Nashiri was waterboarded? Yes or no? Well, Senator, uh, she's from Kentucky. Senator, I, uh, I'd love to answer that question, but, but it's classified. <laughs> Richard Burr, you're out of time, uh, Senator Wyden. OK, next, <laughs> I'm thinking. Now, if, if Ron Wyden had another minute, what would he have asked? Uh, Ms. Haspel, uh, who was it that, that classified that information? And she would have had to say, well, actually, Senator, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the case. So they went to executive session. This is supposed to let the American people know who's going to be the head of the CIA. And she's able to, to make classified all the arbitrary information on her. So, I said, you know, McGovern, this is not really right, you know. Now, there's a, a police officer stationed between Gina Haspel and the rest of us, and she had to go to the bathroom or something, so I walked right up in front. I said, now, excuse me, but I think that Senator Wyden is entitled to an honest answer to his question. You know the answer. You have the papers. She, she was in charge. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you could hear for the next uh, couple of minutes. Stop resisting! Stop resisting! Stop resisting! <laughs> That's what they say when they want to grab you and carry you out. So, yeah, it was pretty rough. There were four of them, and as soon as they got behind the closed doors, they, the way they say it is they, they threw them to ground. It was not ground zero here. Certainly not holy ground zero, but the hard floor <laughs> of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, anyway. So, long story short, I was... Uh, they were pretty pretty angry, and so I was kept overnight, which is not a pleasant experience, but it's an experience that I recommend to all of you who haven't enjoyed that experience yet, and most of, probably many of you have. You see how people are 
who are labeled the other are treated. I've had the pleasure of being not only in DC holding facility, but in what they call the tombs under the justice, in quotes, center in lower Manhattan. And all I could think during all that time was what Dostoevsky said about how you measure the level of civilization in a society, and that is visit the prisons, see how people are treated. So I went, I went through that, and then uh, the question was, uh, well, it looked kind of interesting. It was too late. Uh, they closed the urine sample office, right? So they got to come back. You got to come back tomorrow morning uh, because we only had 12, 24 hours to see if you're, you're, you're high or on drugs. Or so I went back the next morning. Now I walk in, and the urine samplers, you know, they're not the highest ranking officials in the DC police or in the <laughs> Capitol Police, you know. And uh, they're, they're there, and I say, I'm Mr. McGovern. And they say, Mr. McGovern, oh, way to go! We watched you on TV last night, way to go! Whoa! <laughs> they know what it's like to be tortured. They know what it's like to be subjected to what I had just gone through, even though it's one, one night in prison, yeah? And so somebody has to accompany you in while you deliver the goods, right? And as I went, he says, You keep doing what you're doing, Mr. McGovern, you keep doing what you're doing. Now, that was worth that was worth the price of admission. To that. that was worth it. So, long story short, at the end, um, I went before the judge a week, ten days ago, and uh, the government said, "Hey, we don't want to prosecute you. Maybe there, maybe somebody in government is a little embarrassed about appointing a torturer to head of the CIA." So I said, "Okay, Mr. McGovern, if you." Uh, uh, don't get arrested for six months and stay away from the Senate office building for six months, then we'll make it just go away. Now my, my pro bono lawyer said, now this is probably gonna happen, so would you please just say, yes, Your Honor. I know you like to make a lot of speeches, but just as a personal favor to me, Ray, would you just say, okay, because they're gonna say, you have to promise to be a good citizen for the next six months. I know you're gonna take a lumberage of that, but please, just say, yes, Your Honor. And so I summoned all my courage and I said, yes, Your Honor. So I'm a free man. <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> yes, please. You mentioned that um, there hasn't been a nuclear war, which is somewhat of a miracle and somewhat a result of the extraordinary activism of the anti-nuclear movement. And you also mentioned that actions are worth doing just because they're the right thing. But I'm curious about that space in between where doing the right thing has an impact. And I'm wondering, especially because of the insights you have from being inside the system, which of the things that people do actually affect policymakers and people who are in a position to either do horrible things or do good things? Which are the ones that actually get through and have an impact? Yeah. Well, thanks for the question. It's a really good one. Uh, I'm, you know, this is beyond the, the can of, a, of an intelligence, intelligence analyst that was looking to figure out what the Soviets were doing. But I will say this, uh, that uh, people could come in here and arrest me on the spot and put me away, uh, not telling anybody where they're putting me, and they could keep me, for, not forever now, I don't want to exaggerate, just until the end of the war on terrorism. <laughs> That's the law, folks. That's the National Defense Authorization Act signed by Barack Obama. That reverses over a century, what we used to call, uh, what's the Latin word, posse comitatus, which means, you know, you can't, or you can't use the army in a domestic situation. And that was because of the Civil War where some of these guys in South Carolina were using the army for their own nefarious purposes. So, now they can use the army. Now why is that? Well, I don't know for sure, and this is sort of speculation, but this all came just at the time of Occupy. Occupy Wall Street, Occupy, 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 all over the country. And they, that scared the hell out of them. And as you know, they got the FBI, CIA, everybody together, and they leaned on all the, on the, the mayors and so forth, and they made sure that this thing would go away. But they couldn't be sure. So what happens? 
What happens if Occupy grows? And it's more than just 2,000 people in Washington. Maybe it's 50,000 people. Whoa, that's enough to surround the Capitol, prevent us from going home to have our martinis in Georgetown. Uh, it could be dangerous. What? We have the DC police. Oh, the DC police, part of the 99%. Oh, the Capitol police. Oh, the Capitol police, part of 99%. Oh, we got the Secret Service. Well, they're probably boozing it up somewhere in uh, Guadalajara. Oh, I know what we do. Let's make it possible to use the army. The so-called volunteer army, which is really a poverty draft army, these kids will do what we tell them. And if we tell them these people are trying to overthrow the government, they'll do whatever we tell them. I think yeah, that's how I reconstruct it, because the timing was all, all that, that timing when Wall Street and when Occupy was really big, where it looked like we had a head of steam and we could do something really dangerous, like infringe upon the rights of the muckety mucks in, in, uh, in Washington to go home and have their martinis in peace. But that's no gain saying the fact that we are liable. And all I have to do is say, well, McGovern says something good about Al Qaeda, or he said something good about Saddam Hussein, and, and I'm sympathizing with the enemy. It hasn't happened yet, but you know, read Chris Hedges. They did a they did a, a suit and they get rejected. Uh, so even even journalists are not immune from this. Thanks for the question. Was that an answer? Yeah. Well, it was a specific question. Did Occupy work? I guess it did. Well, I think yeah. I mean, it showed the power of the people. Uh, they were able to suppress it, and we have this incredibly suppressive law. But uh, you know, there's no other alternative, in my view. If there are a hundred thousand of us. And I think even the folks in the army might say, well, do we really want to obey laws? There aren't enough prisons for all of us, that's one thing. You know? What are they going to do with us? So I'm a big, a big uh, advocate of putting your body into it. Now, I'm preaching to the choir uh, a lot. And, but you know, I'll, I'll say this one thing, that uh, when I stood and turned my back uh, to Hillary Clinton as she was making a speech, at the uh, George Washington University, I was brutalized by, uh, by the cops and took me out. As soon as the doors shut, I was brutalized, put in jail. Now, what happened? My Veterans for Peace folks, the folks who helped sponsor all this, and brought me here, brought me up, uh, they sent out a bunch of emails. And Hillary Clinton got thousands and thousands and thousands of emails and lots of telephone calls. Why? Well, American people are kind of funny. They, young people, uh, young people, and you just go, oh, they got to come into the, you know, I got to get beat up. Well, I got to, you know, they don't know. Old people like this, with this color hair? Man, Americans don't like to see old people get beat up. That's a reality, okay? Now, for those of you who haven't thought of this yet, this is a major chord that you, have, you can play that none of the others can. Put it into play, use it. They're not going to kill you. They're not even going to break your shoulder, which I was afraid might, might happen. Uh, and when young people say, well, wait a second. These guys have been around for a while. They care enough. They care enough to encounter this kind of repression. And so there must be something really important here. I think we owe that to younger people. And so that's my word to people who have a little gray in their beard or their hair or something. You have a distinct advantage in this realm, and you ought to put it into play. And I've tried to do the same. Next question. Yeah, I, I just wondered, you mentioned that you thought it was a good thing that the, uh, that, uh, that the President uh, Trump met with Putin. Yes. And, uh, but I wonder, you know, we don't really know what they discussed. Mm -hmm. And specifically for this group, we don't know that there was anything discussed about nuclear arms reduction or if there was any advancement in that. So I'm wondering, what's the, what's the rationale for saying well, the, the atomic clock or whatever it's called is moved back two minutes? If, if we don't really know if there was anything specific that mm -hmm. was advanced. Mm -hmm. in, in, okay. So we're interested. That's a good question. And of course, it's being asked all around. 
Now, who is uh, uh, Donald Trump's national security advisor? Anybody know? John Bolton. John Bolton. Now, what's his history? He's the guy that he's the guy that nixed the anti-ballistic missile treaty as soon as George W. Bush came into power, and that treaty had kept the peace since 1972. I was there in Moscow when that was signed, and I had an incredible sigh of relief because this, this mutual assured destruction had become mutual assured uh, something else. In other words, there were two ABM systems allowed in each country, later one, and neither country could think that they could launch a first strike without immediate retaliation. So there was a balance there. Once John Bolton mixed that thing, persuaded Bush and Cheney, we don't need that anymore. We can put ABMs in Eastern Europe and Baltic Sea and Black Sea, which they're doing. Uh, so he's, he's, the, he's the advisor. He would be there. Uh, who's, who else would be there? Uh, Pompeo. Who's Pompeo? My oh, God, you know. He said, well, you know, Pompeo's uh, he's a guy from Kansas who thinks that the Russians have horns. and. Uh, has been educated at the, the hands of uh, the feet of uh, James Clapper, the head of national intelligence, who said, and I quote, you have to know the history of the Russians. They are almost genetically driven to be deceitful, to be blah, 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 blah. almost genetically driven. I mean, I mean, that's not only stupid, it's racist, for God's sake, you know? So, so he's got Pompeo there, educated by the likes of, uh, of these guys. And you got, now if I were Trump, I wouldn't want those guys in you know, my conversation with, with, uh, with Putin. Um, and you know, as far as arms control, was it discussed? Well, those were the terms of reference to the degree there were any under which this summit happened. When Putin advertised the uh, advanced Russian weaponry, in his major State of the Nation speech on the 1st of March, he concluded by saying, now look, you wouldn't listen to us before. Would you please listen now? Let's sit down as soon as possible to talk about arms control. Whoa! That was the 1st of March. After he won re-election for six more years in Russia, uh, Trump and uh, congratulated him against the advice of all his advisors. Do not congratulate all caps. <laughs> These guys are loony, okay? You always congratulate somebody who wins an election, no matter who it is, if you're, even in communist time. So, what am I saying here? Uh, what uh, Trump said is, yeah, let's get together and talk about arms control. Now, that is the quintessential, uh, that's the that's the omnicide question. That, that's the one that really matters, okay? It matters above all and every other thing except climate change that, that we haven't talked about, but that's equally dangerous. But if you can't sit down and talk with your, your other nuclear power about arms control, or at least say, hey, we ought to talk about renewing or making sure that the START II treaty keeps going and make sure that our military people are in touch with each other in Syria, well, if you can't do that without, without absorbing the kind of criticism that Trump has been given, well, you can't do much at all. Now, again, I hold no brief for Trump, but on this one, he's like that broken clock. He's right twice a day. Just one, one other thing there. Uh, with the, the Trump, uh, the main Bolton and Pompeo, uh, to their position, so to say that uh, he, he wouldn't uh, have them that's a really good question. You, know, what you have to realize that Trump isn't his own man. He's not his own man. He's got very strict parameters around him. He may be the president of the United States, but he can't even do simple things. Like, for instance, by law, the CIA and the FBI were supposed to release all the documents having to do with John Kennedy's assassination last, I think it was last October. In the morning, Trump said, I'm proud to announce that all those documents are going to be released. Three o'clock in the afternoon, he said, 
I'm sorry, uh, the CIA and the FBI won't let me release them right now. Uh, in six months, we'll have another look at them. Uh, check back with us in six months. Now, that was April. Remember what happened in April? Anybody remember what happened in April? Nobody remembers because nothing happened. <laughs> you know, if I were a journalist, I would have marked that on my calendar, right? I would have asked somebody, well, you know, what are you, you going to do now? So he's not his own man. The deep state is very, very real, uh, and they are a big break on what he wants to do in a healthy way in reaching out for less tension with Russia. There's a lot of people making a lot of money profiteering on war. And to the extent you can get a bugaboo like Russia, which is not the threat it used to be in the Soviet, just you know, an announcement from our sponsors. The Russians are not trying to take, the wor take over the world anymore. Okay? They're not. Okay? Take it from me. I've watched them for 55 years professionally, and I majored in Russian and taught Russian before that. Okay? Now, uh, what are they trying to do? They're trying to be safe. They're trying to protect themselves. And you know the notion that they really wanted Trump to win, I'm sort of odd man out on that. Let me tell you what, how I, you know, watching Russian leaders and Soviet leaders for 55 years, you get an idea of what their priorities are. And in my view, the priority of someone like President Putin is to make sure that there's some sort of stability, that there's some sort of predictability in Washington. So here he is watching the, the election campaign, right? And he's got his advisors around him, you know. He's, and he's like, oh my God, this, Putin, this, this Trump guy, man. He's, whoa, he, he's unpredictable? He brags about being unpredictable? He's mercurial? Uh, and and he, he lashes out at the slightest slight, real or imagined. Oh, man, this is going to be really fun. And do all you can to help him win. Will you please get, get this guy? Because when he gets his fingers on the, on the nuclear cause, oh, man, this is going to be, give me a break. Predictability is the cornerstone for a strategic relationship that, that is stable. So it, it strained credulity from the beginning. Besides the fact that there's no evidence, and we can talk about that later if you like, but a strange credulity that, uh, that uh, Putin would stick his henchmen, his, Syria, his uh, intelligence guys, to help uh, Trump win. And the other thing, you know, let's be logical here. Let's be all source analysts. Who is going to win the election? Who thought Hillary Clinton was going to win the election? All right? She was a shoe in. Everyone knew that Hillary was going to win. New York Times, everybody, she's going to win. Okay? So here's Putin. You know, um, this assumes he's not clairvoyant, okay? okay? So he's talking to his folks, and he says, you know, looks like Hillary Clinton's going to win. That's, that's no big, that's, well, it's, the Germans had a way of saying it was eine Wahl zwischen Pest und Cholera. <laughs> uh, it was a choice between plague and cholera uh, in our election. So I think Putin felt that way, and he said so pretty much. But he said, uh, you know, he says to himself, okay, she's going to win. But, you know, let's have some fun, you guys. Um, hey, GRU, you're not doing anything else. So hack it, try to hack into the DNC. We just find out what you can find out. You know, they'll find out about it, and then it'll be held at bay. But she already hates us, you know. So, yeah, go ahead. See what, see what. I mean, it doesn't parse, folks. It doesn't parse. Now, if there was some evidence, well, I could change my mind. But those are the, you know, the strategic, the analytic realities that I work in. And uh, I just can't conceive of uh, Putin having a big favor uh, to, for, for Trump, despite the fact that Trump did advertise the fact that he wanted a decent relationship with Russia, because Putin knows better than most of us that there are restraints. And don't we know that now? There are very tight restraints on how much Trump can move toward not detente, but even rapprochement. It's a decent relationship with Russia. So I don't think he had inflated expectations as to what Trump could do. I think he was worried sick about what Trump might do if this unpredictable mercurial guy got into to office. Please. Do you have a... Uh, no, we got a mic right there. Like 
to comment on our policies in Iran. I get very impatient with the need to make Iran an enemy. And uh, when I write our congressional delegation to remind them how we overthrew their governments, I don't get back a response if there are any relationships. Yeah. Well, most of you know that uh, when the CIA was a fledgling operation outfit and uh, Mossadegh, the freely elected president or prime minister of Iran, the first and only freely elected prime minister of Iran in three millennia, if my history is correct, okay? But what did he do? He made a big mistake. He said, you know, this, these, these British, they have these oil companies and they're, they're drawing the oil, they're profiteering on our oil. Maybe, I, I think it might be a good idea to have some more of the profits go to my people, uh, Iranian people. Now, the British Secret Service, MI6, took the fledgling CIA by the shoulders. And now, this is what you do when some upstart, <laughs> some upstart in a place like Iran, thinks that the oil under his sands belongs to him and doesn't realize it belongs to British petroleum. That's it. That's an exaggeration, but just about this much. And that's what we did. We overthrew the government. And every th ever since, that's 53. That's a long time ago, folks. But there's a lot of animus that, especially since we put in a guy, uh, the Shah, who was, whose secret police was the, the equivalent of the Gestapo. And I do not exaggerate on that. So what's happened recently? Well, you can't understand US policy toward the Middle East unless you realize that it's dictated by a country called Israel. That's the only way you can understand it. What, what threat do we have of Syria, from Syria? What threat do we have from Iran? Uh, now, it's not only Syria, it's Saudi Arabia now too, because they hate the Iranians as well. It's some kind of religious thing that I don't quite understand. But let's, let's be very frank about this. US policy toward Syria, toward Iran, is first and foremost dictated by Bibi Netanyahu. Now, how many of you have seen the latest memorandum from veteran intelligence professionals for sanity on Iran? <laughs> I'm gonna cry. I'm gonna I'm gonna cry. cry. We'll share the link today. Please. Before I left, though, when I should have been packing, we put this, this memo together. And it was addressed to the president. It's about our 55th such memorandum which is not that much, about three a year. We started when Colin Powell told those lies at the, at the UN. So we said to President Trump, look, President, you're being misled. And we're reminded back in 2002, before the war in 2003, that we gave President George W. Bush the benefit of the doubt, and we thought that he was being misled too. And so we told him, right after Colin, Powell spoke hours after, same day, right? It went out on AFP wire, okay? We told him, look, Mr. President, it doesn't parse. There's no threat from Iraq. And what you need to do is broaden the circle of your advisors beyond those who are hell-bent on a war for which we see no cogent reason and from which we believe the unintended consequences are likely to be catastrophic. So we picked up from there and we said, look, Mr. President, this time, if you make a war on Iran or allow the Israelis to do, spell catastrophic, all caps. <laughs> now, you need to realize, Mr. President, that if you think that Iran is the prime sponsor of international terrorism, you have been misinformed. That was the case four decades ago, three decades ago, Probably. No longer is it the case. That plaudit, that honor goes to Saudi Arabia. Or, you know, we claim a part of that, part of that credit as well. And we didn't say that goes to Saudi Arabia. We didn't want to knock his nose out of joint. So we just said, there's no longer the case that Iran is, now does it do some terrorism? Yeah, it's prepared to do it. If you attack it, watch out, it can do it. But it's no longer, as you've been told, the prime sponsor of international terrorism. More important, Mr. President, Bibi Netanyahu, when he did that slideshow on the 30th of April, was relying on information that we know was forged, 
We know it was bogus, it was fraudulent, and we know who did it. It was the country of Israel. We knew that. We've known that for 15 years. So if you want to learn more about this, that information in your, your suggesting shows that Iran, despite the IAEA inspections, despite our colleagues in Western Europe, despite all that, that shows that they have a secret nuclear weapons program. That's not true, Mr. President. Last thing I'll say on that is, I think, equally important. And we say it in this memo. Uh, there was a time after the debacle on intelligence in Iraq, and for those of you who don't realize, that intelligence was not, not mistaken. It was out and out fraud. And to my great dismay, I know some of the guys who did it. Bush said, I want to make a war on Iraq, and it's your job to gin up information allowing me to do that, and they did. Now, after that happened, after that debacle, Iran was in the crosshairs. We saw it. We saw President George W. Bush saying, Iran's just about to get a nuclear weapon. Uh, end of October 2007, Iran is just on the verge of getting a nuclear weapon. And the Israelis are pounding the turf saying, yeah, we have to do something about this. And guess what? <laughs> a year earlier, the intelligence community chagrined at what had happened to their reputation looked around for somebody honest, some manager that would do a good estimate, an honest estimate, on Iran this time. They couldn't find anybody in CIA, so they went to the State Department intelligence outfit. They found the Assistant Secretary of State for Intelligence. His name was Tom Finger. He now teaches at Stanford. And they said, Tom, would you run an estimate? Bush and Cheney are saying they're just about to get a nuclear weapon in Iran. Would you do a, an intelligence estimate? And Tom said, are you kidding? My God, it's the last thing I want to do. I mean, I want to retire. Uh, I, I've been through the, the, neck, the crucible of the Iraq estimate. I don't want that. I said, please, please, we'll let you take some of your experts that are in the State Department of Intelligence. We'll, we'll give you free reign. You can do it in secret. And as a patriot, which he is, he did it. And so in November 2007, this estimate came out, and it said, and I quote, uh, we are, with high confidence, all 16 intelligence agencies of the US intelligence community have concluded that Iran stopped working on a nuclear weapon at the end of 2003. And it has, has not resumed work on a nuclear weapon. Whoa. Now, that, there was a big sigh of relief on the part of Mike Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The last thing he wanted to do was send his Marines up the cliffs there at the, at the, the choke point there uh, in the Straits of Hormuz. And, and so I'm not sure this way it happened, but there are enough people with an interest in preventing Bush and Cheney from launching a war in Iran as their last war before they left office in 2008 that they went to the White House and said, you know, this is going to leak. I mean, this is not what you've been saying, and Congress has a copy of this estimate. This is sure to leak, so maybe you ought to uh, preempt that by, by getting out ahead of this. And so Stephen Hadley, who is the uh, National Security Advisor, you want to see something pathetic. <laughs> he gets up the next day and says, oh, well, you know, we've been saying that you run it, but the intelligence community says uh, that they have not worked, but, but we still think it's a threat, and so do the Israeli. It was just really, really so painful, you know? Bush goes to Israel and apologizes for the estimate. Because I don't agree with it, but that's what they say. Now, you don't have to believe McGovern on this, and I'm not suggesting that you buy Bush's memoir, okay? Decision points is what it's called. But if you read it, go to the library, okay? If you read it, this is what he says. That estimate was eye-popping, his word. It deprived me of the military option, his words. Quote, for how could I authorize a military strike on a country that the intelligence community says has no active nuclear weapons program? <laughs> Close quote, bummer. <laughs> he says it, he must have written this part himself. I mean, what, what would have been the normal reaction? 
Are you sure? Have you seen it? My God, all the Israelis! Whoa, what terrific news! They don't, they don't want that. So, you know, if you want any further proof of what was up there and how an honest intelligence estimate, and I have to say this, I've been involved, I, I chaired a couple myself, all right? And I've been involved in that process since 1964. And this is the only time that I know that an intelligence estimate had uh, played a huge role in preventing a, a, a terrible war, okay? It did, and it was honest. Now, what about today? I don't know if there are any Tom Fingers around today. So what we did in this one paragraph, and I'll be sure now, uh, we said, well, look, Mr. President, this is what happened on Iran last time, okay? Be advised that Bush and Cheney were going to go to war, and we found out that they were being told a bunch of lies. So this time, realize that this is a intelligence community assessment. Gone through a year-long process. You know, it's a painful process. You have 16 agencies, you've got to take it, but this one was good, okay? Now, Mr. President, in contrast, you were shown on January 6, 2017, something that was a very, very different animal. This was not a national intelligence estimate. Despite what the Washington Post and the New York Times says, it's not an intelligence community assessment. And it's not even an assessment by CIA, FBI, and NSA. Now, first of all, NSA and the FBI don't have any real role in analyzing intelligence. That's CIA's job. But people say, well, all right, wasn't the, wasn't the 17 intelligence, it was only three. No, it wasn't three. What was it, folks, do you know? It was hand-picked analysts from these three agencies. Now, you probably can understand that if you hand-pick the analysts, you're hand-picking the conclusions, right? And who hand-picked these analysts? James Clapper. What does James Clapper think about the Russians? Well, they're genetically, almost genetically uh, driven to be deceitful. So, you know, the president probably doesn't know. You know, he, they probably told him this was an intelligence community assessment. The last thing I'll say on that is this was pretty bad. What happened was Obama authorized this thing. It was to be done in about six weeks, and it was. And then on the 5th of, of January, he was briefed on the results of this assessment. A, an evidence-impoverished assessment, which said that Putin himself had authorized hacking through the GRU on our election. Okay, there was no evidence there, and what evidence they alluded to, we have already disproven. Now, what happened? Well, Obama said, "Yeah, okay, sure." Brief the president-elect. Next day, January sixth, in comes James Clapper, James Comey head of the FBI, John Brennan, head of the CIA, and Admiral, what's his name? Admiral so-and-so from uh, Rogers, from NSA. Rogers. Right, 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 okay. And so, here's the assessment, Mr. Mr. President-elect. You need to know this, and this is you know, what we'll come up with. And uh, then, by prearrangement, James Comey lingers behind when the other three leave. What does James Comey say? He says, uh, Mr. President, uh, we thought it best for me to brief you on this uh, individually. Uh, we have this dossier here. Um, uh, it's a little embarrassing and it's not been verified, but uh, you should know that, that we have this dossier which shows, uh, alleges that you were with prostitutes in Moscow and, and that you would, it's really very scarless. And you, we just, just want you to know that we have this, uh, you know, so now, <laughs> some of you know this is the old tried and true tactic. When you get a president-elect, you get the intelligence community, the deep state, to say, now, Mr. President, we do have this dossier, and uh, we don't know if it's true or not, but uh, probably other people have it, so just so you know, just so you know, okay? Now, if I were Trump, I would have thrown that guy right out on his ear and I'd say, clean out your desk, as soon as I'm in office, you're gone. Comey. 
Now we know that that dossier was ordered and paid for by whom? Uh, Clinton, yeah. And who else? See the news just two days ago? The Federal Bureau of Investigation paid this guy steal, I think, six times. So, you know, don't look at me as I'm, I'm sort of crazy or something when I talk about the deep state. Now, when, when, Trump, when Trump did fire Comey, what did he say? Oh, and this is a big indictment of him in the press. He said it was this Russian thing, right? And everybody says, ah, ha, ha, oh, collusion. He's trying to suppress. He's sorry. Well, no, he's talking about what Comey tried to do to him. And he said, look, Comey's in charge, actually one of the forces behind, with Brennan and others, including Loretta Lynch, attorney general, and her minions right below her. They're all in cahoots. They wanted Trump to lose. They wanted Hillary to win. And they all thought Hillary was a shoe in and if you don't understand that they all thought Hillary was a shoe in you can't understand how our top law enforcement officers all thought they could play fast and loose with the law and do the things that they did. They thought they would get awards for that. They never thought they might be indicted. So this is really important stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll close with this because it's getting to be the noon hour, and I thank you very much for your attention.